It's January 11th, 2021. This is Rook. Maybe it's the fact that there's such a tradition of suppression in contemporary Iran that those intent on reaching for the moon are all the more impressive. Dr. Maral Yazarlu Patrick has seemingly never met a challenge she won't overcome, and that includes busting ethnic and gender stereotypes on her journey to a Gen Next Icon Award this year. Maral was once told by a man to not ride a motorcycle. Her response has been to become a motorbiking world record holder who's traveled to seven continents in 64 countries. She's a fashion designer and PhD to boot. Maral Yazarlu joins us, plus the Rook team with letters and Mona from Melbourne with the Persian proverb of the week. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 75 of Rook. How's it going, everyone, around the globe, listening in? Omidvar hastem ke halitun khubbashe. We are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on SoundCloud, on Instagram, on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, and Telegram. I'm going to be joined by Dr. Maral Yazarlu in London in just a little bit. She's she's this Iranian woman who set the world record for riding her motorcycle across the globe, 64 countries, over 250,000 kilometers, a few years in the making. She's also a fashion designer, a PhD, and BBC News crowned her one of the 100 inspiring and influential women around the world a couple of years ago. So she will be joining us. Plus, we have more from Melbourne calling in from Australia with the proverb of the week in about an hour from now. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hello, Gian. How was your weekend? It was okay. I I just read a lot. I don't know what else you want me to say. What were you reading? (laughs) Uh, I started a book called Sapiens. Have you read that one? I love that book. Yeah, I'm very interested in human society and how we came to be that say for example f- how human beings chose to storm the capital last week i'm trying to understand you're going humans. way back yeah, to I understand <laughs> humans right right yeah. uh it was kind of a somber weekend yeah. you know uh i mean obviously remembering the innocent and radiant folks we lost on ukrainian flight ps752 um we had that special edition of rook at the end of last week and i, I, I hope people will check that out if they're interested our our most streamed episode yet on telegram which is a relatively new platform for us. So Mm. um, a lot of people were interested in that episode. Again, I'm grateful to the uh, families of the victims who came on our program. And um, you you know what? It must be hard for them. uh, I I mean, obviously it's hard for them, but also uh, people want to hear from them at this time of year, uh, you know, on a one-year anniversary. They want to speak out. They want to keep the, the... the campaign for Mm -hmm. accountability and justice alive but to have to keep revisiting this in interviews i i i was so glad to have them on the program i was moved it was emotional we were all in tears but at the same time i felt bad that i was even doing the interviews you know putting them through asking them again about their loved ones yeah it's frustrating a year later and there's I mean, there never will be justice in the sense that they're never going to get their loved ones back. So it's, it's, if, if we're heartbroken over this, just imagine how they're feeling. Yeah, I can't well, imagine. And as I said uh, last week, all of us on Rook knew folks on that plane, and, and it, it, it doesn't get easier yeah. when, we, when you actually see, think about it and you yeah. just think about the, the injustice mm-hmm. of what happened. Uh, there was a couple of other people who passed on the weekend that I, uh, <laughs> to kick off the show today, we were talking about people we've lost, but there's a guy named Michael Apted. Do you guys, you guys know who this person is? I mean, he's 79 years old. He's a British film director. Shia, I thought you might uh, know of him. So he, beca- or Reza for that matter, a filmmaker, he, he became well-known um, a little later in his career for 
some some quality Hollywood movies in recent decades. Coal Miner's Daughter, Nell, Gorky Park, Gorillas in the Mist. Uh, there was people who won Oscars for being in those films, etc. But the reason I loved this guy is he started this thing called the he started the it was called the Up series. He started in 1964 when he was in his 20s, and he he followed 14 seven year olds of different sexes and classes in Britain. In 1964, got them on camera. This was it was black and white, etc. And then do you know, do you know about this Reza? Yeah, yeah, this and then one, every yeah, seven one, years yeah. he filmed them again. He filmed them again. And yeah. he did this through his old life. Like mm-hmm. this is good. This is a commitment to documentary mm-hmm. over you know 60 years of this guy's life, right? So every seven years, so it started as a film called Seven Up in 1964, and then there was 14 Up and 21 Up and 28 Up and 35 yeah. Up, and. Uh, it, it was fascinating because as the kids grow older, you, you know, they, you revisit the same 14 children or who become adults. And based on their class um, status, I mean, the film is kind of demonstrating that we are streamed in, 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 in our social economic status to to it's a predictive where in the beginning you can see where it's going to go as they get older and they, mm-hmm. they all end up exactly almost how you would predict them, you know, in, wow. in terms of not being able to cross those class lines, et cetera. Uh, some of them end up going to dark places. Some of them are successful, but it's a really fascinating doc series that this guy did. Imagine knowing in your twenties and going, I have this idea and I'm going to film people for the next 60 years. Right? So the last one came out, I think a couple of years ago, it was called 63 up. But if you, if you can see this, this series, it's, it is fascinating. Yeah. It reminded me of, um, Richard Linklater, uh, boyhood. Because he kind of tried yes. to do that. Uh, with, yes, with that he did it over a period fiction, of time. Over yeah. a period of time, but it's yeah. the same actor. And this is up. actually a documentary. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would actually recommend it's somewhere in the middle. It's the best, mm-hmm. like thirty-five up when they're thirty-five years old. It's 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 fascinating. The other person we lost, uh, or we can talk about losing uh, over the weekend. You know, yesterday uh, marked exactly five years since the death of my hero David Bowie, and so I played a lot of Bowie over the weekend. Uh, I have this playlist of my top. 100 Bowie songs that I've had for years that I move and adjust all the time like like some kids would play with you know uh, little action figures you know can create a little I create Bowie lists and wow. you know. <laughs> Interesting. Um, anyway it sucks that he's no longer in the world and uh Shai, you like the fact that I called him Ostad in my post. <laughs> in, I posted on Instagram and hashtag Ostad. Yeah. Ostad was yeah interesting. Yeah. Yeah, how many songs does he have? Overall. That's a good question. A hundred? I didn't even know he had a hundred. Yeah, you Bowie? You, I, yeah, I, I'm, oh, I'm not Bowie. a super fan. He started in nineteen mid nineteen sixties. So mm-hmm. by by his last no, time. I mean, you selected a hundred top songs of. That's Bowie. correct. So my many, top one hundred. So how many? I don't know. Out of a thousand or wow. two thousand? Wow. I don't know. Two thousand. Well, songs? I mean, Bowie. You know, he put out. Uh, I don't know. 40, 40 albums or something. That's a lot of albums. Wow. And if you include the soundtracks and you know so. Hey, I should mention to you guys, there's a new Rook Reed that uh, Thoughtful Nagin, part of our team, has done. She's uh, written a new piece called, Does Iranian Art Have to Always Be Political? Mm. And she answers it, no. Wow. Huh. That's definitive. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Do you, how would you answer that question, Shia? No. Right. Yes. She's inspired by the interview with uh, the great Iranian sculptor Parvis Tanavoli our episode number 62, if you've not heard it. She says that Tanabali was has not always been political in his art, and that's okay. We don't have to, we don't need him to have to fight every yeah. political fight. But there is this pressure that Iranian uh, artists feel, especially mm-hmm. in the context of, you know, the last 40 years, to, to say something, do something, they have to be speaking out mm-hmm. about. Um, so it's an interesting question she asks. Yeah. I'm glad this. the three of you have read this. No, it's I, on our I, website. I was speaking to Nagin earlier. I was like, I can't wait to read this. Yeah. It just went up. So at uh, rookmedia.com for our Rook read, rookmedia.com. Um, I guess we have letters about, about the special that we had last right, week right, on right. the flight downing. So we will get to those. Yes, we, we will. We'll have Mona from Melbourne coming up with uh, teaching us something, a saying, an idiom, a, a proverb, something. Uh, Groovy Shia, Captain Reza. Fabulous Keon, see you in a little bit. Let's get to our feature guest. Our feature guest today is an Iranian motorbiking world record holder who has traveled to seven continents and 64 countries and traversed over, uh, well, hundreds of thousands of kilometers on her bike, most of it riding solo. 
She got married on that worldwide ride and finished her ride when she was six months pregnant. And she's a successful fashion designer and PhD. Someone has been busy. Dr. <laughs> Marol Yozalu Patrick is also an artist, marketing professional, motivational speaker, TEDx speaker, campaigner for women's rights, and more. Marol was born in 1981 in Kelarabad in the north of Iran. She was raised and received her education in Iran. In 2004, she relocated to India and pursued her master's and then a PhD in marketing from the University of Pune. She holds the record for the highest mileage on a superbike for ladies with over 250,000 kilometers. Her achievements in the biking world have earned her numerous titles and awards, such as Queen of the Superbikes of India, Pune's Most Powerful Award from Femina Magazine India, and BBC News crowned her one of the 100 inspiring and influential women from around the world in 2018. And this past year, she received the Economic Times Gen Next Icons Award. Maral currently lives between New Delhi and London and is writing the memoir of her travels. But first, right now, Maral Yazarlu Patrick joins me from London, England. Hello. Hello. I'm exhausted just reading all of the... <laughs> just, you know what? I just really enjoy to just sit quiet and listen. I'm like, woo woo, I've done great. <laughs> really? But part of you is going, I need more kilometers, more kilometers. 250,000 oh, I mean, isn't all enough. part of me, just all over me, <laughs> one more kilometers. <laughs> you know, you're such an adventurer. First of all, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you after learning of all your travels. I, I'm guessing that a global pandemic has been really hard given your desires to keep traveling and always be on the move? Because of this corona and what happened, we had to postpone our upcoming travel plan, which supposed to start in March 2021, but now going to delay for a year or two. But that supposed to be me and my husband and my two years old kid in a camper and the first route supposed to be Alaska to Ushuaia but now unfortunately we have to delay it for a year or two with saying that uh, the 2020 actually gave me a really good time to spend with my little one that's the reason I cannot really complain <laughs> I'm just okay with what happened in 2020 what well, I mean in my life but I mean traveling for sure I really miss it and I miss my bikes I figure you'd be, be driving you nuts not be able to I mean if the, this this is clearly your passion and you've made it your yeah. your journey around the world to be contained to be caged somehow even at the hands <laughs> of a global pandemic uh it's like you're, you're like a superhero who's not allowed to practice your superpowers it's, it's yeah tough. but you know what uh, uh to just tell you everything is okay my husband is alive and breathing that means i'm doing just fine uh. i didn't kill anybody for last one year <laughs> Well, that's also an accomplishment. Your husband is still alive. <laughs> oh, this is a tremendous journey you've been on. And, and I, as you just alluded to, you're not stopping in 2021. I'm going to ask you about that. But let's start from the beginning. I mean, when you were a little girl growing up in the north of Iran, were you someone who always wanted adventure and, and to see the world? Would you have guessed that this is the person you're going to become in your 30s? You know, I mean, I always wanted to travel the world. That was something that didn't change. And I do have a very adventurous mother who traveled a lot. And I remember when we were a kid, one month a year, she used to uh, take her backpack and say, 11 months of the year, I'm yours. One month of the year, I'm myself, for oh, myself. Wow. And then she used to take the backpack, go travel, hike, or go abroad and do whatever that she wanted. And it, that always remained in my head, which, uh, and, and plus, traveling was part of our uh, most important thing in our life. It, I mean, when we were really young, it didn't mean that we have to travel outside or abroad, but just traveling within different cities or just go here and there. And I wasn't like a person who suddenly wake up and said, you know what, I want to travel the world. I did have some experiences before that. And I started traveling at a really young age. But to be honest, I never knew that I'm going to be a crazy biker because I never got introduced to biking earlier. 
which I'm glad I didn't because I could just like speed up and kill myself. But, but it sounds but, like it sounds like given your pedigree, given who your mom was, that yeah. you would have the consent or blessing overall of your parents to be an adventurer. I mean, uh, in juxtaposition, we had, for example, um, Sara Safari on uh, a couple of months ago, and and she's yeah. this incredible woman who's uh, you know climbing all the the big mountains, Everest, and all the the mountains around the world. This is very much to the consternation of her parents who who say yeah. no please just remain an engineer it sounds like in your case oh. they would they would <laughs> let you they would want you to be an adventurer in some way you know they wanted but the thing is about my family uh, and about my mom uh, they they didn't i mean they didn't mind me to be an adventurer but for being an adventurer i had to pass a couple of a stage of my life like i never ever could be an adventurer if I didn't finish my higher education. Uh, this you is know the Iruni, I mean? Iruni part here, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right, and right. what was that Iruni party was like, I need to get my bachelor, then master, then PhD. And when my mom was asking me, what's my plan about post PhD? I just said, mom, <laughs> I call you back because I just lost you. I can't hear you any longer. Like, signal right. gone. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've been a very good girl the other side. And the adventure after that, and plus one really important thing is when you become independent, financially it gives you the freedom of taking a decision in your life yes which crazy decision like just leave everything and go and i'm sure if i wanted to still be dependent on my family and asking them sorry can you just give me a couple of hundred thousand dollars to go for this trip (sighs) not everybody could be (laughs) open-minded but i love the i love the iranian parental trap right because it's 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 just get your masters um just become an engineer just get your phd (laughs) as exam then you can do whatever you want then you get then you get no no, but but here's the trap part then you get the phd and Mm. they say Yani PhD to get get FT Halam Khai motorbike very but you know uh, <laughs> hey fair, you know, that now you should just you know become this you know business what, person you know, or it's funny thing is because I've been asked in different platforms like what was your mom and dad uh, approach or your family approach about you buying a bike? And I was like Oops, I didn't ask them before I buy it. And you know what? I didn't I didn't just call them and say, like, excuse me, mom, can I just buy a motorbike? I bought it and I was just like, wow, look at see what I I mean, I bought the Harley. My first bike was a Harley Davidson. And I didn't even ask anybody because that's time I didn't even uh I mean, it didn't came to my mind that I have to ask. Well, let me let I me get thought. to that. Let me get to that because yeah. by the time you're buying the Harley, you're already mm-hmm. you know. I mean, you've accomplished more than most people do, and uh, some people do in a <laughs> lifetime. So, you you leave to study in India in 2004. You get your PhD. You start a very lucrative career with a major company in India, dealing in marketing yeah. and business. You're you're traveling the world doing seminars, but you're based in India. Things are going very well. Yeah, but that wasn't enough for you you wanted to then design as well why why wasn't the the comfortable life of being an executive what you had worked towards in your phd in marketing enough for you at that point you know i mean that was one of the dreams that i had and one thing about me is i have a very sharp memory and i note down and i'm very clear like i note down one two three four five there are my dreams goals and where i want to go and then i just go for it and brand was one of them and i didn't want it to start initially to get to that because i knew that i need to earn money first even when i was much younger uh, I, I've done it with a plan. It wasn't like that, that I said, like, I woke up suddenly in the morning and I said, let's just do, um, let, let's just go for design and be a fashion designer. I planned it for years. I waited to reach the level that I have the money that I can do it, that I have a knowledge because I took a couple of months and I went to Milan and I study design there. Well, well hang on a second, because it's not just that you, you're, you're extremely extremely it's clear now through this already in this interview that uh you may be a wild spirit who gets on a motorbike but you're also quite tactical and smart about how you've led this life of yours so far yeah Uh, but it's a little bit more than that you you don't 
seem to have a sense of limits or barriers. I mean, you you, you leave to study in Milan to become a fashion designer. You become yeah. a fashion designer. It seems like you yeah. really set, and you're you're on the Paris runways. I mean, you you seem to really set your mind on something and do it, and to not have the limits of thinking of round around. Well, I'm this Iranian girl who's in India. How am I going to end up being a well known fashion designer? That doesn't seem to enter the mind of Maral Yazalu. Uh, would that be true? Yeah, that's correct. And I'm going to give you a little bit of how my brain works. Because um, it's a logic which works very strong for me. And then there is emotion and then there is other stuff. And uh, I do have, I mean, I become much better after 30. When I left Iran, when I was 20 or 21, and when I got to India alone and tried to manage and study and see everything, it wasn't easy at all. For the first two years was so tough, which I've done it, finished it, and I was one of the 30% of the student in the class who passed it in the second year and uh, with a really, really good marks. And, you know, that proved it to me, I can. And, you know, starting from zero and reach where I wanted to reach once, twice, three times, four times, that proved it to myself, nothing is impossible in this world. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it in a book. I didn't go to the classes that someone, the Guruji comes front of me and said, listen, no, I earned it. And when you learn it and when you do it and a step by step, you reach where you are then you have such a confidence in you about you can do anything and everything. But you know, and this, yeah. Well, I, what I was going to say is that, um, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to cut you off. If the, mm -hmm. Your story to me is an interesting one in terms of playing with stereotypes. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. Because on the face of it, I you know, yeah. the, the thing you're most known for at this point, I mean, perhaps uh, other than in some fashion circles or in some marketing circles, et cetera, is your trip around the world on a motorbike. I mean, you're with the world record holder. That's what that's what you're known for. And, yeah. you know, we'll get to this part of the story because I really want to ask you about it. But, I mean, you get married in Machu Picchu in Peru. You get on your motorcycle you know, the next day. I love day. breaking all the stereotypes. Well, uh, well, exa but, hang on a second. Me, hang on a second. For you. <laughs> you're, it would seem on the face of it you're kind of like a hippie like you're you're sort of got this bohemian lifestyle at the same time and here's where it break, breaks the stereotype for you to accomplish what you've accomplished i mean to recap you worked as the head of a retail chain for 12 years 14 hours per day you had your own fashion brand at the same time you're starting to bike on the weekends to be able to manage that, get the PhD, do all of that, become the successful executive, travel, do the seminars, that's a very focused worker. That's not the traditional bohemian hippie that wakes up at four because she's wasted from the, the, the smoking too much last night. The night before. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> this is, and the other way that you play with stereotypes for me is somebody who is this ambitious, especially, I think, I don't want to stereotype us, but when it comes to Iranians, often has to do with with acquisition like I'm yeah. I'm gonna start this business I'm gonna be a designer I'm gonna get my PhD because I'm gonna make a lot of money and I'm gonna have a big house everyone knows or at least should know that traveling the world on a motorcycle is not going to be your fastest way to make a lot of money so yeah. that clearly isn't the most important thing to you in the world despite the fact that you're an ambitious person it's not only about material acquisition would that be correct yeah, but one thing is there. It's not the fastest way of earning the money, but definitely the fastest way of spending your money. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. No. You know what? You know, the thing is um, about, like, I mean, as you said it absolutely correctly, when I'd gone to India, it wasn't only for me to go on a study. For me, was I was very spiritual. I wanted to go to India because I wanted to uh, get to know myself better. I wanted to go to different ashram. I wanted to go to different temples. I wanted to do meditate and so many things. And this is one side of me. And as a human, we have so many different sides. And uh, 
I don't know, thankfully or not, but each side of me is crazy and extreme by itself. No, but there are trade-offs, right? You can't, you're not going to be able to do your trek around the world and build your fashion design business at the same time. That's correct. It's just, you're going to have to trade off, yeah. That's the reason you need to know and you need to set your priorities right. I couldn't just set up go around the world when I started my career because I need to reach that point save enough money, earn enough money. So and that then you can I, blow it all. I, you can blow it all in <laughs> one and a half years. I mean, still when I think about how much I spend, some part of me start hurting and burning. But I think that was the best thing that Yes, I've but ever what done you've done, me. I mean, what you have done, listen, people have spent uh, money on, on much less profound things. Let's, yeah. let's get into this, uh, this journey. Because first of all, when were you first, when do you remember in your bones, in your soul, being first attracted to motorcycles? What was that moment? I never, ever had a feeling for motorcycle. I got to know motorcycle in India because a friend of mine had a Royal Enfield, which they call it Bullet, which is 350cc and was just parked in front of his house. And uh, I was just resting on his bike when he was in the house and I was waiting for him to come out. And when he came out, he was just like, "Uh uh-oh, just get off. And I'm like, why? And he said, you never, ever sat on any bike in your life. I said, so? I'm just resting. He was like, no, but, you know, you can't ride it. (laughs) And the way that he said it, it hurt my ego. And I was like, you know what? If I want to do something, I do. And one of the day when I came to, went to office and I just entered my cabin, there was a magazine on my desk, which I look at it, and there were just like crazy good-looking bikes. You know, it got my eyes that I really liked it. And then... I let it be there. And then after two, three days, one of my colleagues came in and said, hey, Moral, have you seen these bikes? I recently hardly entered India. I said, I don't need more sign. I'm fine. I just don't (laughs) want to look at it. I was in Bombay, and I clearly remember I had a meeting with the head of Louis Vuitton, which just came from France. Very bad meeting. And I came out of the meeting, and I would just like look around, and then I saw the showroom of the Harley Davidson. And I told my uh, driver to stop, and I went inside. I love the bikes. I didn't know anything about the bikes. I just love the way that it looks, <laughs> chrome and leather and all that thing. And it started tickling me inside, and some part of me was like, oh, this is so cool. I went and I just chose the bike, and I said, like, I want this bike. And the guy said, uh, but we don't have it for uh, trial for the test ride i said i didn't ask for the test ride i said i want this bike and these guys didn't know i understand hindi they told each other she thinks she's buying a lollipop (laughs) to confirm that i'm buying a lollipop i said i don't want a yellow one i want an orange one and well my only concern was the color of the bike i want (laughs) Then I paid the deposit, and I, then I got the bike. Bike reached me in one month, and my first ride was Bombay to Pune for 200 kilometers, which, I mean, story pause, I become a most committed rider in India. I mean, the woman rider in India on a Harley Davidson. I made an effort, go back to the same showroom and said, hello, guys, I didn't buy a lollipop. I bought a bike and <laughs> now the whole India knows my name because of a lollipop that I bought. And again, a story passed. The same guy who told me, get off my bike, pay man, and my world ride. I went to him in Spain, went to his house, and I told him, sweetie, don't touch my bike. Wow. (laughs) I've learned one thing, which is that don't get on the wrong side of, don't get on (laughs) the wrong side of morale. (laughs) So why were you, so now it's clear that the, it's the, you know, it's, it's energy in your bones. It's fuel running through your, your body to, to ride a motorbike at this point. But, but, you know, you're still an executive at this company. You've got a good career. You've got the, the, the money, the funds. Where does the point go? Where do we go from let me my, ride my motorbike around on the weekends in India or whatever to a desire to ride around the world? I think I exhausted myself. I think I work too much 
and I start in my dream books, I start taking all the things that I want to do. Like I, I backpacked 67 countries before I started the world ride on a motorbike. And after the country number 15 or 20, sky is the same everywhere. Then I was just like, okay, traveling. And then I was like, PhD done. I'll become a vice president of one of the biggest company, done, salary done, I launched my brand done. And I reached a point of my life which I couldn't see any uh, hope in the future. And I reached the point of my life, I was like, now what? And you know when is exactly like a drug when you just keep giving it to yourself, your dosage goes really high. And then you reach the point and you are like, now I'm not getting high in life anymore. I just need something more. And plus, I reached 35 and I was like with my lifestyle, which I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating, and I'm, but I was exercising really well two mm -hmm. hours a day. I was like, maximum I'm gonna live 70 if I'm lucky. And now I'm exactly in the middle. And I really wanted to know who I wanna be. I wanna be moral, the corporate girl i want to be moral the fashion designer i want to be moral the crazy biker i want to be the more which moral i want to be i want to be moral the painter moral the wife and do you know one thing because i was working so much and my only concentration was being successful and earning money i wasn't getting involved in any relationship mm. and I had several unsuccessful relationships because I didn't give time. And uh, I mean, I always, that was typical me and everybody knew about me. I call you back and you never hear anything from Moral. Wow. Or message used to come and I used to say K, not even okay. Mm -hmm. And that just used to make my friends really angry. I'm making a list. Don't make, <laughs> don't make Moral angry. Don't date Moral. There's a whole list of things that I can oh, yeah. tell Why people. Why is going to be a huge <laughs> list? <laughs> and you're going to hand over the medal to my husband. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But you know, the thing here, let me just, just stop you there for a second. And I, I mean, does anything really answer this question you know be rook uh, mm -hmm. does anything intimidate you i mean again to recap for folks you come from a country in which riding and race bikes are not permitted for women you go to india where roads are not entirely safe for women to ride solo you decide that you want to be riding solo in fact you become the first woman in india to own and ride that harley davidson as you just said in every case you're breaking gender barriers you're breaking boundaries does anything intimidate you in general? You know, I mean, when I started doing all that, it wasn't that uh, like I want to be the one. I just loved it because, and you know, in exact that moment, it, nothing came to my mind except the fact I want to do that. But when I got involved, when I start uh, being recognized, when I start then, it become a, uh, really good challenge for me because always they kept me as a woman next to a man and then I start enjoying breaking all the egos because they used to put me and they said you know what men doing that but there is a woman and you know what the Initially, when I started, I didn't have it in mind because I was not competing with anyone except enjoying what is going on within me. And uh, biking was my runaway from my crazy uh, life, like work. And, and you know, when you are a corporate girl in that level, you always need to be uh, following some certain rule and pattern, uh -huh. like uh, suited, booted, always done up, like... But uh, what was interesting for first couple of months before all the articles uh, come out and I become like uh, well known in a biking circle and I get to the cover of the magazine, nobody knew that crazy chick was showing middle finger crossing the truck drivers and beating the truck drivers because they're drunk and crashing the bikers on the middle of the highway is the same girl who wearing a five inches heels on Monday <laughs> walking to the meeting room and trying to boss around everybody in the office. Mm. You know what I mean? That was two different characters. But with saying that, when I was in the office, 
wasn't that easy. It was so tense. And many uh, times I wasn't who I am. I had to follow some rule. I had to be someone who achieving this mm -hmm. and finishing the meeting, mm -hmm. doing that. But when I was sitting on a bike, when I was putting a helmet on, I was feel like that I'm entering my own world, which is a fairy tale. I could think about anything and everything that I wanted my world no. look like. And that become a place that I run away from my life to it. Mm. You know, I made music that I wanted. And plus, I didn't need to be who the society want me to be. Mm. I didn't need to be who the corporate want me to be. I was moral that in the new circle, in, within new people, I was parking my bike, getting inside of a tiny little street cafe, mm -hmm. having my dirty chai, chatting with these truck drivers in Hindi, and nobody care who I am. And that was what got me deep down to biking. But you know, uh, you still didn't answer the question. I mean, everything you said there was very was most interesting, and I appreciate it. But, but in terms of anything really scaring you, I mean, have there been moments, say, when you took this trek across seven continents? Mm -hmm. Did you do you ever wake up and go, okay, I'm somewhere in South America? I don't know if I can do this, or this that this that hill is really scaring me, or okay, I, I <laughs> this got, is I got your I got your question wrong. That's the reason I went. I didn't mean to just go to the other direction. <laughs> and now I got your question. My toughest time and moment was before I leave. Every damn morning, I woke up and asking myself, "What the hell I'm doing?" Ah, oh, this is what I'm living. Asking my perfect life that so people calling like the best life anyone can have and with my prime time in my corporate and plus it didn't help when all my colleagues and boss came to me and said what's wrong with you you're ruining your life you're right, ruining your right, career right what you need you need more money double of your salary what the hell you need and my colleagues one by one used to come to my office and say i think you have to think twice because you've been crazy maybe you had bad times but you shouldn't do that your life and i mean this drove me nuts because every morning i mean at night i just wanted to sleep and don't think mm -hmm. and in more in the morning i used to open my eyes i was just like hell moral what what are you doing what if you're making a colossal mistake somehow yes, what if you're because, halfway through the trek and you think oh my god what have i done and i've destroyed my career i mean and all even that. if you are a month or two or three months down the line you lost your job you lost your life you're gonna come back leave the rest of your life with something which like what the hell and i'm so not how do you convince right. yourself that it's gonna uh, how did you make that I decision couldn't. the only thing was i just hold on to my decision if, i mean i cried i was angry i was tense i was uh dealing with so many different fears and everything the only thing I didn't do is I just didn't cancel my ride. It, it, for me, it was a little tiny rope which I hanged on. I just hold it tight, wow. and then I was waiting for the day that I leave. And when you leave, also first day you are like, uh, okay, but there's only one day left. I have two years to go. <laughs> then second, third, fourth, right, and you right. know, I mean, one week gone, but you still you have two years to go <laughs> were you physically preparing for this like as if yeah. like an astronaut that's going to go in space yeah, were yeah. you you i mean clearly you have to think about the fact that you're going to be it, this is a physical slog too sure. right to be sitting on yeah. a bike going around the world different climates different Absolutely. foods different energies um, yeah so I, I, I've wanted to, I mean, I, yeah, this would be an entire show just asking about the mechanics of this, but, but briefly, can you tell me yeah. like, how did you approach 
each new country how do you how much of this was planned do you for these 64 countries did you know exactly where what you were going to do exactly how much each day where you would stay i mean most backpackers i've known in my life the the successful ones have an element of i'm going to see what happens i'm going to go and you know if i end up loving cyprus i'm going to stay there or something yeah uh, but, but I, that's how it should be okay so do you so Otherwise, so how prescribed like is adventure. how prescribed is was your journey okay uh, uh initially i have to just uh correct something that you say earlier when i started the ride i wasn't alone i started with the right partner indian guy called pankaj who supposed to be my photographer and videographer and my ride partner we started together from india after seven eight months when we reach uh, south america unfortunately he couldn't continue because of back egg neck egg and so many body problems on a motorbike after eight months of continuous riding wow. and then from there i decided to go solo and uh, just i wanted to tell you like as you said for the body wise is so important because if everything works as uh, at your favor like money wise plan wise everything but your but uh, your body give up then you're done and i did uh, exercising for seven years i was training before that in iran i was uh, exercising and training i have a black belt in karate done too of course you do yeah no yeah <laughs> just add it to that list next yeah, to yes. do not make moral angry <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right uh, yeah and i was like a head of the swimming team and i was the uh, I mean, part of the volleyball team. And then I was the uh, first group of softball in Iran for the national team. Like, I have a very sporty background. Uh -huh. And um, when I went to India, I started exercising and I've been training for seven years. And for But I didn't train for going on a bike for seven years because I didn't even know I want to do that. When I decided to go for the last six months before I go, I start special training for a core training and i start doing a different uh, variation of training for that added yoga added this added that and plus uh, riding in india for a couple of years really helped because i believe if you can ride or drive in india you can do it all over the world and i proved it <laughs> And uh, what, what are the increments that when you're riding, when you're on this trek around the world, how yeah. how many hours is too many hours to be on the bike? When when how many how often do you have to stop? Uh, it depends on weather, depends on road, depends on uh, your that day exactly how you feel like. I don't follow pattern, and plus I wanted to do the real adventure. My timing was get up on the sunrise, pack your tent, have your lovely breakfast, cook your breakfast, have your coffee, and uh, sit on the bike and ride. If you love the view, stop. If you want to sit in the cafe for the longest time, do it. If you want to just uh, uh, ride along the coast, do it. If you want to change your direction, do it. I didn't have anything to tell me, no, moral, you cannot do it. Except if that was so dangerous. Like if somebody told me, the local told me, don't go that way because you're not going to come back. That was a big no-no. But And then before sunset, I was starting looking at the flat surface and a, a safe place to put my tent and asleep. Yeah, I mean, this is my question. You're traveling the world in a tent. It's all fine on your motorcycle during the day somewhere in you know Africa or South America or whatever. But 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 what happens at night? How do you, uh, uh, as a solo female rider, yeah. ensure your safety? You know, you don't know. Like I just trust trust the existing and have faith. I mean, it maybe sounds funny, but you have no other choice because, I mean, I could think of um, asking local, but one problem is there in a country uh, like the countries in continent Africa or some part of South America is more dangerous if the people know where you are and is more dangerous if they know is it. A woman alone in that corner in the tent maybe you don't want to make a huge announcement mm. that uh, you know I'm, I'm is that safe that I go and I say in that corner but 
some places that I wasn't feel really safe, I prefer to put my tent closer to the police station, which that didn't really work well in Mexico because you don't want it to get to the police station. <laughs> <laughs> were you were and you speaking English in most places? English and. Uh, shaking my head hands legs uh -huh. and a little bit of a spanish in south america that i could find my way or where to stop and, and Mara, to if, if i say what was the most daunting moment mm -hmm. or the scariest moment of the track does your mind go went to one place immediately oh yeah and what would it I be mean, it goes to two three uh, directions give, give us one one was in mexico uh, and my right partner still was with me. We stopped on a, a petrol pump, and then a guy, a, the, I mean, the couple came on a BMW as well, speaking Spanish. We spoke English, and we understood the guy said, if you're going to go towards this direction, follow me. A BMW bike stay. or a car? On the bike. A bike yeah, okay. We were on a BMW bikes as well. And then they said, you can stay with me. And then from there, you can just go to the border. And we just trust. And we said, okay. We rode 10 hours following the sky, not knowing where we're going. And we reached at 11 o'clock at night in an empty, crazy road, middle of nowhere. And everything dark. And the guy said, Mikasa. I was like, what the hell, Mikasa? There is nothing here. My house. And he yeah. said, you have to uh, jump the divider. I said, I can't jump with the bike. And I look, I look at my uh, right partner and I said, Panka, she said, I'm ex exactly feeling what you feel. This is scary shit. And I turn, I, I mean, the guy said, don't worry, these guys will help you. I <laughs> look back, a truck stopped behind me. Six guys came out of the truck with a little knife on their belt. Oh, my God. I said, I'm dead. I got my phone out to uh, send a location to the family group that I had and my uh, to-be husband to just know at least what was the last uh, location I was. That was no signal. Mm -hmm. And then I was just like, okay, nobody even want to find my body. Where in Mexico were you? I was 100 kilometer before crossing the border to the next one. I don't even know the name of the place that we were because okay. when you're following, you just yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I told, and the guy said, okay, and these six guys came, took my bike, lift my bike, put it over the divider, and I drove between the trees and I went inside. And as soon as we got in, there was a huge dog running to me. And that was exactly like a mafia movie that you watch. <laughs> And I was just like, all right, holy shit. We went inside. That was an empty little place, stone floor, and one plastic chair. I was like, that's your casa? This is your place? <laughs> Story short, which I was dying. Like, for one hour, I, I couldn't move because I was so scared. Then we got to know because... We couldn't understand his Spanish. He couldn't understand our English. This wasn't actually his house. That's supposed to be his farmhouse, middle of the coffee plantation. That six guys were his worker, which they <laughs> came in the truck. Right. The knife is what people in Mexico carry with them. And that's part of their culture. And I mean... The picture in my head was totally different with actually what it was, but that was the most scariest moment of my life. Thank God you weren't alone. What about the the highlight? What would be the what comes to mind when I when you think of a country or a place that you were on this journey that that was a real highlight? I think I really loved Peru because the entire country for me was like full of hearts and full of good memories and I was riding through to get married there and full of emotions and lovely food, lovely drink, lovely Spanish music, everything. Well, I let's really let's talk about getting married. Well, first of all, your your husband's name is Patrick, yes? Alex. Al oh, Alex, sorry. Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Surname is Patrick. <laughs> Who's Patrick? Oh, that's the surname. <laughs> I knew I had Patrick in my mind. Okay, Alex. Um, yeah. So, so tell me about meeting. Where do you meet Alex? India, seven years ago. Okay, so this is pre-journey. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. I, now, Alex has to be a. I, I've been thinking about Alex through this because yeah. obviously you guys got married, and I. Uh, he's obviously devoted to you as you are to him, but yeah. he's got to be a very understanding guy. This Alex, because um, I don't know how the the love yeah, of his life is saying. Uh, love you. By the way, I'm getting on a motorcycle for the next couple of years <laughs> <Yeah>. alone <laughs> yeah. and traveling into, you know, uh, what were the conversations you would you have know, with the Alex? Thing is we met seven years ago, but he was busy in his life. I was busy in my life. And we were keep catching up when there was a party or opening of a brand or something. And we would just keep bumping to each other. But we didn't look at each other as something or being in a relationship. And we actually start dating when I knew that I want to leave for the world ride. Okay. And uh, so it was part of the deal. It was baked into the deal. It was part of the deal. Listen, pal, this is part of, you know, this comes with the territory. Yeah. And you know what? To be honest, I think that was one of the main reasons that we could be ourselves and so carefree and be who we are actually because we knew that i'm leaving and he knew that okay whatever that relationship gonna be she's going and we had the best time because we were just happy no fight no argument no talking about future nothing did you think the relationship would survive this journey no, we said bye. <laughs> that was that was okay. no surviving. All right, you you picked yeah. the motorcycle over poor Alex. So yeah. the, so then, how do you reconvene? And then we, yeah. I left, and uh, he started following me. And we, we, every day we were in touch. We were messaging each other. How was your day? It was okay. How was your day? And bye bye. And whenever I had the internet that I could communicate, like some days I didn't have. And then he started saying like, okay, I do have a weekend uh, that I can travel where you reached. And I was like, okay, I'm in Thailand. He was like, oh, that's great. I have some boxing session and I can see you in Thailand. I said, okay. Saying boxing session, weekend off, now is a holiday where you are. He followed me to 15 countries. Wow. Yeah. And so Alex wasn't really to- saying goodbye, it sounds like. <laughs> no, he wasn't. No. I mean, to be honest, I wasn't also because when I left, I had a whole day to think about love. Before that, I didn't have. I was so busy. And then I was just loving someone, caring about me, loving mm. someone, asking. And his love wasn't cheesy at all. Like, he didn't say, oh, baby, I miss you. He wasn't like that. He was just like, okay, you are one day closer to me. Well done. Now you you are one country closer to me. And that, I mean, I I think I just got my fuel to do the entire journey with the love and care he was giving me along the way. But but again, I think, I mean, I love how unique you are and how industrious you are and how adventurous you are. As the story goes, you guys end up getting married in Peru at Machu, yeah. Machu Picchu, no less. Machu Picchu, and, and, yeah. and you design your own dress. You guys get I married did. there. You <laughs> arrive late. And mm-hmm. after the wedding, you you get back on your motorcycle and leave the One next day. day. After the I mean, wedding, I have yeah. to say, I don't know if I'm <laughs> taking the guy's position here, but my my heart goes out to little Alex, you know, big Alex. I don't know what if Alex, <laughs> Alex is Alex. big or little. Okay, big Six big Alex. <laughs> yeah. I, I worry about the feelings of Alex. I mean, you know, he gets married, and then you know his he his new. He managed it. He managed it excellent he was really supportive and good he was really really keeping up well and you know i mean he never it never ever been a point that he told me what the hell you doing he never ever been a place that you told me like you know why don't you come back and that was like a great support because if you have someone keep telling you what the hell are you doing and how's everything? You, you, you know, in one point when yes. you're really down in your trip and in one point, which is like you're not doing that good, you're just like, you know what, maybe I have to go back. But I didn't have that. And that's, that's the respect that I keep for him, I mean, in my life because the support and whatever that it was was actually really really helping yeah he's your guy he's certainly yeah. is that is that nafas we're hearing hearing in the background 
Yeah, and that's me running away from the room. <laughs> that, that's your that's your daughter. Her name is Nafas. Nafas so, Elizabeth Patrick. Ah, uh-huh, Nafas Elizabeth Patrick. And you you get pregnant on your trek, by the way. Yeah. And you yeah. continue to ride solo around the world for the first yeah. six months of your pregnancy. Now, this Correct. was obviously a decision you had to make. Oh yeah. Tell, and tell that me was about how one. how worried you were about the toll this this might take on you physically. Yeah, I mean, uh, first thing, I always wanted to be a mother like that. I had that feeling that I would not be complete if I don't go through this experience. That's the reason that I wanted to have a child and I was on a ride and that was a decision. And then I was just like, okay, now I am pregnant. And that was the toughest part of the journey right at the start of continent Africa. And the fears of, uh, I wasn't worried about how my body going to be because I never been pregnant before and I never knew how it going to be. My fears was I'm responsible for another soul and human who's growing inside of me yes. because till that day, the decision was about me going for a ride, being crazy, continue. And uh, from that moment on board was about me and taking a risk on some uh, other soul's life as well. And that was really, really um, making me like I, I had a couple of really hard days mm. to decide what I want to do because in one, uh, one side, if I wanted to go back home, I never ever could be happy because I knew that I left the ride and I always would look at Nafas as the reason I couldn't reach my dream. Mm. And I never ever wanted to do that because I wanted to have my kid as unconditional love front of me, yeah. not the example of, oh, you born and I couldn't continue. Yeah. And um, the second thing was, if when the kid comes, I wanted to be that super mama, 100%. And I couldn't sit on a bike and sit, Alex, take off Nafas, and I'm going for another year. Right, that right, wouldn't course. happen no. also. Then the decision was, okay, let's just look at it. How can I, it, can I at all continue? And uh, I check and I start reading and I start doing different stuff on the Google to see there's no other crazy woman on the world who done it pregnant. They've been some women in the car or they've been some women for a month or two as a pillion with their husband, but they never ever been a solo world traveler on a motorbike. And uh, I start looking around. I start seeing what's going on. And one of the day that I was riding through uh, villages in South Africa, I parked my bike, I sat and I was uh, listening to my music and looking at the field. And I just start noticing these African women Pregnant like they're going to just give birth that moment, nine months pregnant with two, three kids around, working whole day in the crazy uh, temperature and on the field. And uh, then I look around and I saw like some other pregnant woman carrying huge, heavy stuff in their head. And then I was like, this women are living their life. Mm. Nobody told right, them right. you shouldn't carry the heavy thing. Nobody told you. Maybe the only thing I need is I just forget whatever I know about what society taught me about being pregnant. Maybe I have to be just natural because, I mean, the animals just giving birth, all human giving birth is not a disease. It's just like a natural, like a natural right. things that are happening. I took this attitude and I started continuing and Alex was a help to sending me different proteins because in Africa I had a really tough time to getting food, like a right food because I couldn't get uh, food poison. And uh, it's, I it's, it's, can I just say, I mean, hmm. it, it, you know, the, you have so much strength talking to you that I feel like, yeah, of course she could do this, you know. But but on the face of it, it's <laughs> yeah. it's it's quite scary. You're 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 a, you're a pregnant woman who's riding solo through Africa, um, yeah. at times not understanding the languages, not exactly knowing where you're going to go, not exactly having ha- having a plan. Uh, this is um, you know, th- it takes quite a bit of gumption. But again, um, and and there's so much of this story that I. I 
want to take hours and hours <laughs> to <laughs> excavate from you, but I, we can't keep you here forever. People can see parts of your journey and all that in, in, uh, in your social media presence, which is quite compelling. I, I have to get to when you talk about societal expectations, not just of a pregnant woman, but of, of uh, a woman from the Middle East. A woman, as, yeah. a, as an Iranian woman, you are not allowed to ride a motorcycle in Iran, but you did. Yeah. You crossed the border, the Iranian border into, into Iran at one point and rode there as part of your trip around the world. Tell, yeah. t- tell me how that was possible. Uh, I started running a campaign for Iranian women, and that uh, started when I left for a ride and I start getting so many messages from Iranian women which they were saying like oh how lucky you are and then I was just like why they were like we can't do that because we are not allowed to ride a motorbike it, but you know till that time I didn't even know I knew that they are not allowed to ride a bike but I didn't know how tough it is in Iran and there are so many women who want to do it because I thought nobody wanted then I promise each and every of them i said for my part of the responsibility as an iranian woman i start running a campaign to showing the first whole world we can as a woman from the middle east or iran that if don't think that we are just those a woman putting in the kitchen or washing a clothes on the river. And I don't know why everybody in the different part of the world still thinks Iranian women are like that. Okay. I told them I will come back to Iran and get the permission to ride across. And when I do that, after completing my journey, which means traveling to seven continents, as, as many countries, I will send my request to government of Iran for changing the law for Iranian women. Because it's easy to sit in your home and say, can you please change the law? But I've done it all. I proved it. I've done something that no man in the Asia and Middle East done it. Right. There is no man Although in Asia I, and Middle East I, 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 I would suspect that that would, that the Iranian government uh, being what they are would would dislike that <laughs> would, you know what you, know, would you be- can't believe it but you can't believe it you know I mean when I wanted to get into the border before getting to the border so many people messaged me don't do it they said you're going to get arrested you want to be you know uh, they're going to send you to Holofduni <laughs> where, where were you coming from from Iraq Turkey or- Turkey, Turkey. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they told me, like, do, I mean, they really, really scared me. And I was really uh, cautious about my baby as well. Like, I just going to get in and if it doesn't go as per the plan. And, but I decided to come in, uh, to uh, go to Iran. And when I reached the border and when I just got in, experience wise, Till today, I can't believe how scared I was two kilometers before the border, which I was saying, God, what the hell I'm doing? Am I doing the right thing? And then two kilometers after that, I got to the border and the guy, the immigrant, um, the guy in the immigration who actually stood up and said, that's an honor for me to stamp your passport and let you in. Oh. I'm not saying that that was a gentleman who... Uh, took me for an hour of question. Uh, I think that was a hat or sat, like <laughs> the guy who just took me and uh, um, that was an agent to just make oh, so sure they that- did, they I, did question you. They did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they did. For one, one and a half hours, who am I, what I'm doing, what is that camera on my helmet, what is my agenda from, where am I coming, all sort of question. But the guy wasn't rude at all. The guy was just asking and doing his job. And uh, and I think, you know, I mean, when they met me also, when they spoke to me, in uh, no angle, I look like a trouble. I mean, I look like a troublemaker to correct it, but I don't look like the person who want to do some crazy right, stuff or right, being involved right. with politics. Then I got in. In many cities in Iran, the mayor of the city invited me and gave me joy. Wow. <laughs> they gave me wow. they just put my billboard before I enter my little city slash village. They put a huge billboard of me. And I mean, I enjoyed in Iran as an Iranian and achieving. And I was so proud of myself and all the... Um, Local newspaper like Kehan, Etemad, and all of them wrote about me and they said, Iranian woman after crossing seven continents and 64 countries entered Iran and request the government for change the law for Iranian woman to get in the license. And that was in all the thing, but I mean, 
we were getting close. There were a couple of other uh, girls from Isfahan did something as well, and we were getting close to push it to get the license, which everything gone wrong in Iran, <laughs> and we still right. didn't get the license. Right. So, uh, will you continue that campaign? Yeah, I still do. Yeah, I still in touch with all the bikers in Iran, and uh, the ladies are some really good bikers and riders there, and plus there are some uh, uh, like uh, people who trying to get to the government and trying to do that. As of now, there is no answer to the request, but I'm sure one day we're going to get it. You know, this has been a very personal conversation, which I really appreciate, but I I haven't meant to minimize the um, yeah. the importance of what you've done. And, and in fact, the distinctions that you've received, uh, the awards, the, 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 the people who've really been inspired by what you do. What what did it mean? What, what do these things mean to you? What did it mean to be chosen by BBC News? News as one of the 100 women of the year in, in a couple of years ago? You know, uh, I can't tell you how it felt because I can just close my eyes and go inside of me and say, wow, that's, you know, it's just like so many butterflies flying in my belly. And I was that feeling of, I've done it and I've done a huge thing because only I know what I went through. Only I know I've been in the road with no human for days and I made it and I've done it. And plus the entire journey and coming and then awards and then being recognized and being the, I mean, uh, all the things that happened it made me a different human being altogether. I'm not a person who left and who was in the corporate world as a designer. I mean, I say a little bit of attitude, but the people said a lot of attitude, B-I-T-C-H, but I'm not that person anymore because the travel that I've done, the moment that I had, somehow I got connected to the real world and I was grounded and I was just like... Uh, I got my priorities right, which happiness is the most important thing and is a choice. And then I need peace in my life more than the huge bank account. There are things that you always read in the book, but I really felt it by end of it. And when these people recognize that, when these people awarding me for it, it just like a proof of I did just great. Amara, what have you heard from fans and followers you said that you hear from people in iran i'm sure you yeah. hear from people all around the world what do they say as to how you've inspired them or or what they make of you you know bob uh so many places i've seen the other bike biker or other traveler which they couldn't even believe because uh, like there's some little tiny woman doing that because usually guys travel in the big groups and then they saw me and then they were saying like damn, what we were thinking about ourselves is all shattered at the moment and we have to just think to be more men. And uh, but that was along the way. And there were so many women giving me hug, like in South America, especially in the small villages, when I was getting to the people's house to sleep, I would just like, can I sleep here? Or can you give me some food? And these women, like all grandmas they used to speaking uh spanish i don't know what they said they used to hug me so tight they were like like you're great and then in italy the they old would they would know they would did they know who you were i mean would, in in they would see the huge bike uh -huh. with everything <laughs> on it right with and i start showing off with my flags all all around the bike is uh -huh. all the flags uh -huh. of uh -huh. the country i've been and then they were like around the mundo mundo and i was like yeah around the world and they were like oh and they used to hug me and kiss me and in Italy the people the old guy used to come to me and used to say bravo <laughs> you know along the way and the m best thing that came to me was in Iran I was parked in I think it was in Lahijan my mom's city I parked my bike and I was sitting on the bike and waiting with the helmet and everything and one really angry guy he was just like around I think 70 he was passing uh, by me and then I felt really hot. I removed my helmet. The guy went. He couldn't walk properly also. He turned back. He came to me and said, you're a girl. I said, I am. And then I started speaking Farsi. And then he was like, Iranian? I said, yeah, I am. And they were like, where were you? I said, I was just traveling the world. And he said, you know what? 
you are the hope that I wanted to see today. Uh, and that was the sweetest. Yeah. And this is the comment that I've been receiving from people. I'm not that active on social media being the full-time mom, but whenever I post and I share my ideas, people have been so kind to me. Yeah. And they're all But see, that old, that, uh, that, old guy, that old guy in Iran doesn't know what would happen if he said, you can't sit on my motorbike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I hope that he never know what's going to happen. I want to think I'm that little angel. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I have so enjoyed this conversation. Uh, for all that we've talked about, I've had this question waiting that I wanted to give give to you at the, at the end because I, uh, I mean it quite earnestly. I mean, I, I'm someone who really believes in travel, who really loves, I mean, as a kid, I grew up in England. I was lucky enough to have parents that would take us every year. We would travel. And so I've s seen much of the world, nothing like you, of course, but um, what, what have you most learned being to all of these countries about if not about yourself, because you've talked a little bit about that, finding yeah. yourself, but about people, about the world. You know what I learned? Uh, my learning was entire world, every, each and every human live the same way, behave the same way, have the same emotion and react to the things exactly the same way. I mean, I'm not going to go to the details of society, religion, families, this and that. As a human, we all, and we born kind. And uh, I could see that in each and every of the people that I was in touch with. I mean, m maybe other travelers have some experiences and have something. But for me, I only received love. And, uh, and I... Uh, start to believe that you give love, you receive love, and mm -hmm. the world is a mirror of you. You want, you see the world ugly, then you definitely need to change something in you. Mm -hmm. And if you think the world is beautiful, then you are going and you are on the right track. I love that. You're about to, I mean, I guess when COVID is over with Alex and yeah. Nafas, you're going to resume your global travels, yep. you said, in a camper. Uh, yeah. as, as a final question, what would you say to your fellow Iranians, fellow, fellow global citizens listening, anyone around the world who's listening right now about the importance of, of traveling and experiencing the globe? What would you, would you, would you say to those wondering uh, whether they should take journeys like you have? Okay, I can, as I said earlier, I can admit the best thing that I've done in my life was taking this journey. And I was lucky enough, and of course, I did a really hard work to be able to do the journey like that. If you cannot do as long as I did or as expensive as I did or whatever, just move, do as much as you can because traveling, I've been in a school whole life till I was 30. And I must tell you what I learn on the road every day. You can't compare it with what I wrote in the book in university. And I read uh, so many books, but what I learned to be in touch with the people and feel the world, never ever going to come close to sitting on the computer and reading about them. And for you, I mean, I always say, I said what I've done, I set an example. And for the whole world to know, and I'm not anybody special. I only have a special dreams. And I'm not very, uh, you know, I'm an ordinary girl with extraordinary dreams. If I can do it, each and every of you can do it too. They only, they only need to believe themselves and start. That's the only thing. <laughs> You're beautiful. <laughs> Nafas is getting in on the action at the end of the interview. I appreciate that. Yeah, she Do just got me the rabbit's little headband. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Marol Yazarlu Patrick, uh, this has been such a pleasure. I thank you. Regards to you, your your friends and folks in India, uh, your husband Alex, your daughter Nafas, your family in Iran. Thanks so much for taking the time and do stay in touch and we'll be watching your travels. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure talking to you and I'm so glad that you spent this time and just take me through the memory.
Yes, yeah, so you just go higher. I, th- I think that I think the next interview is going to have to be with Nafas. Oh, for she's, sure. Yeah, she's I'm getting close to, to the say, microphone there. You know, I want to see who she will be in future. Oh wow! Like I just look at her and I'm like, who the hell are you going to be? <laughs> she's going to be like 64 countries. Well, let me show I'm you, mom. Go to the moon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jan. Thanks a lot. Good office. Thank you. Good office. Dr. Maral Yazarlu Patrick, an Iranian world record holder on the motorbike. She's also an artist, marketing professional, motivational speaker, campaigner for women's rights. Maral Yazarlu joined us from London, England today. Back here with the Rook team, Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, the fabulous Keon. This is one of those interviews that uh, as I was finishing, I was like, Keon's going to say, <laughs> oh, my life is a I feel shit. A, I no. feel ashamed of myself <laughs> right. as a human as being. As you should. <laughs> Please. What have you uh, done? I know. Uh, compared to her. <laughs> I miss traveling. She made me miss traveling a lot. I know. You know, I, I so agree with her dictum that, I mean, she backs it up with this education and with this multifaceted life that she has had, the fashion designer, the corporate executive, all of this, and she's in her 30s. But but I so agree with the notion of traveling. Mm-hmm. I, I, I remember the last time I spent a bunch of time in Southeast Asia, in places like Vietnam and Laos and, and Cambodia, and I, I came back saying to as many people as I could find, Take your next time you go on, you know, take your kids and and don't always just go to the Caribbean to a resort. Like, go go to these places. I mean, we can say that if fortunate, the one great thing about Iranians in the diaspora is most of them have traveled because you have to come from the Middle East, you know. Mm -hmm. But the, the value of going to these places, especially places that are off the beaten track, in terms of learning about. Humanity, oneself, the world, other people, oh, yeah. tolerance. You know? It makes you appreciate your own life a little more. When you see how other people live, you learn more about other cultures and how we all, at the end of the day, are just trying to do the best we can in our lives. And, and as she says, I mean, at the end there she goes, well, well um, what did she say? She just said, uh, I, 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 I realize everybody's the same. Yeah. I mean, that is the underpinning of tolerance, right? That's yeah. You don't fear people. There's no xenophobia. There's no fear of strangers mm-hmm. if you have met Travel them, right? If you've yeah, these yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Captain Reza, you're nodding? Uh, I agree with you. I remember I had a teacher back then, back in high school, and he used to say, money spent traveling is money well spent, regardless of the experience. Mm-hmm. Like, even if you have a bad experience, it's still an experience, and it'll stay it'll stay with you for the rest of your life. Right. So you're saying th- that time in the Chinese jail was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, worth it. it was <laughs> <laughs> I laugh, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. That is absolutely true. It is true. Two but it probably was worth it, actually. It was I mean, it. now that you're safe. Now I mean, that yeah. I'm safe, now yeah. that it, uh, it had a happy ending, it's yeah it was yeah. worth it he didn't do anything he didn't do anything horrible by the way you were no a no, victim no. Of i was a trying to get out of, of a exactly, country yeah trying to get out of country and then uh, just like every other refugee at a certain point in time you know you know um it also made me really want to this whole interview while i was talking to her i felt like a a loser that i'm not more experienced on a motorbike <laughs> doesn't it make you want to be on a motorcycle remember how i said there's certain uh, experiences worth living in my world uh-huh. motorbiking is not one of them but how do you know i mean I, it just seems like these people uh you, you know I, when we were talking to um shima the, yeah, uh, the other part yeah. and i was saying i have a close friend i mean he, he who's a motorcycle a harley guy mm. and he he just speaks of it as the ultimate liberation you know it's seeing the earth like you're just traveling uh, like by car it's i'm different. surprised you're that not, you don't want to be in a motorbike it's just so you dangerous seem, it's yeah, so dangerous. I, I, I'm accident prone. I'm a bad driver. Let's right. put it that way. So yeah. me on a motorcycle okay, is a stay scare. Off the yeah, exactly. <laughs> stay off mountain the road. climbing, <laughs> I can do. Scuba diving, sure. Wait, mountain climbing is not dangerous? Uh, it's not for me. I feel like I can handle it. I have the strength to. And same with scuba diving. That's something I want to do too. Groovy Shia, do you have anything to uh, that did uh, Dr. Moral inspire you or did you... Uh, um. uh, First of all, I think I'm happy with my bicycle. No. <laughs> you don't want a motorbike. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, actually, no, wh while you were talking about uh, it's good to travel, there is a word that we have in Persian, which is Jahanbini, but it's mi mistranslated to ideology. Mm. But uh, I, I think... Jahanbini? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting for me, the people who who have seen less from the world, uh -huh. they think that they has the best Jahanbini, mm -hmm. but they, they doesn't have an, You have <laughs> to <laughs> travel to... Uh, does anybody know what Shai is talking about? <laughs> I'm trying to make sense I of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't understand what he's saying. Uh, yeah. uh, correct me if I'm wrong. People who travel less, they think they know more. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, they, they have the uh, most yeah. hardly uh, constructed opinions sometimes. Yes, and I think yes. that applies to everything. People yeah. who know less in general. They That's do, a, that, there's, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of poetry and lyrics. That's right. <laughs> to quote a mediocre Don <laughs> Henley song, the more I know, the less I understand. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But it's not Jahan Bini. Yeah. I had a little Japan, uh, Jahan, Jahan <laughs> Bini on my bagel this morning. No way. I really... <laughs> <laughs> I had some dill flavored jow BD. It was oh, delicious. Was that new for you? Settle down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, it's Monday and it's we've had a, a new year, we've had some hijinks, we had a Pink Floyd special, and for various reasons we have not been able to connect with our dear friend in, in Melbourne. But you know, each week on this day, she enriches our lives by teaching us, teaching us a language that we did not know, at least some of us. And she completes us in our mission to be perfect English and Persian blended specimens. She's the person behind the popular Inglisi Farsi Instagram page. But as importantly, she is the Persian priestess of Proverbs, the Australian sage of sayings, the wondrous woman of words. She is Mona from Melbourne, our resident Rook wordsmith. And she joins us right now from Australia. Hello, so, hello, hello. Am I supposed to? I'm supposed to say her name last, right, Shia? What was it? Okay, wait a second. Hang on, Mona. And she joins us right now from Australia. It's time for Mona from Melbourne. Wasn't it supposed to be some? What did I do wrong? Um, nothing. You oh. have to say hi, Mona, and she will join us. <laughs> yes, I understand that part, Shia. But weren't you supposed to? play the uh, didn't you want me to it, say something and then you play the music no it's it, underneath your voice it comes, oh, I comes see. Yeah, yeah. so I, what I did was right yeah, 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 oh yeah, I thought it, it because for some of the other ones yeah. like yes. Hoss or yeah, Keon no, no. we have a theme yeah. okay hmm it was pretty anticlimactic. Uh, our <laughs> resident, I know. <laughs> this is the Shia thing. Just sort of like, okay. So now, and then and then he's like, and I'm like, what, do, what am I supposed to do? Uh, you say hello to her, and then she is respond, and then you talk to... Yeah, I understand, Shia. Thank you. Our resident, Rook Wordsmith. <laughs> she joined us right now from Australia. It's Mona. Hello, Mona. Hello. <laughs> what an introduction. Thank you. I know. Sorry. <laughs> I almost people have forgotten my whole introduction to you. It's uh, um, how are you doing over there? You know, I you have some news, which uh, uh, and I only know that we can share this because I saw you, you posted on your Instagram that um, uh, something uh, this new year may bring new things. Do you want to tell yes, us? Indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yes, um, you're a great secret keeper, actually. Yes. Um, so we, uh, uh, my family and I, are expecting our third child this year, <laughs> March this year. And you've Thank been you. uh, yes. you've been learning. I don't know if this has anything to do with the proverb today, but I saw you did. You had a great post on the English Farsi site about uh, the the Khan the, 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 the pregnant woman, uh, the, yeah. a list of things <laughs> that I, I don't know what was it. What to expect when an Iranian woman is expecting. Ah, <laughs> yes. yes, especially when it comes to food. I, I too am a shekamu, so um, a lot <laughs> of our <laughs> a lot of our pull is related to food and sour food, especially. So um, I've been craving fiorshu by the truckloads. So ah. ah. <laughs> well, what are you bestowing upon our imaginations today? Is it a word? Is it a saying? Is it a proverb? What is it? <laughs> Well, this week is actually going to center around um, a body part because a lot of the proverbs we've been doing have been related to animals. Um, and I thought we'd mix it up this week with a saying that's related or centered around um, a body part, the okay. eye, the window to the soul. Okay. Yeah. So, um, cheshm, as you know, is eye. Yes. Um, and cheshm has a lot of synon like words that sound the same, like chash, which means, I'm sure you know what chash means. Yes, or okay, sure, yeah. 
Chash, yeah. yeah. So, um, Cheshman Chash. So, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is Cheshmetun Roshan. So, that directly mm. translates to may your eyes be bright. Yes. So, um, do you know the meaning behind this one or do you know what it entails or when we use this saying? Has anyone want to chip in, Kian? <laughs> uh, so, I always hear it when you're, like, for example, my parents don't usually live here. So, when they come back, people say Cheshmet Roshan. I never really knew why people say that. I, I assume that meant, oh, your eyes are, should be open that your parents yeah. are here. <laughs> That's right. So may your eyes be bright. So hopefully this new year will bring about a lot of visitors and a lot of travel and we can actually see our loved ones, hopefully, okay. <laughs> if they're not sent back to other countries. Um, and uh, that's the first thing. So Cheshmetun Roshan, may your eyes be bright. Okay. The next one is Cheshmetun Choshkel Mibine. So this one, I thought, uh, ha have you ever heard it used in context? Do you know uh, when we would say that, when someone gives us a, a particular... Cheshmetun Choshkel, say it again. So your eyes see something beautiful, or your eyes see something beautiful. No, I don't know if I've used that. I don't know if I've heard that one. So usually, my grandma says it all the time. Okay. So if I compliment another female and say, "Wow, like I love your, you're so beautiful," they will say, "Cheshmetun Choshkel Mibine," like your eyes are beautiful to see. Mm. Yeah, so your eyes are beautiful, so they actually see beauty, they reflect the beauty. So it was interesting because morale was actually alluding to that where the world is a mirror of us. Wow. We we see mm, what we want to see, see in the world and I think that that's a really nice way of actually you know, complimenting someone so about it. Reza and Shire are yawning. They, 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 <laughs> this is really old hat to them. <laughs> They're like, tell us something we don't know, Australian woman. No, I think it's well, appropriate to say Cheshmetun Roshan. Because she's having a baby, right? Oh, yeah. that's right. <laughs> is that yeah, that's Roshan. right. A link it. Is. Well done. That's right. So we wanted to link it into something like that. Um, and the last one is actually um, an interesting one. It, it goes back to tradition and a lot of um, uh, historical um, symbolism. And it's the Chesh Nazanam. So it's really talking about the jinx or the evil eye, which... Um, actually dates back to a lot of cultures and a lot of heritages and I've got a little bit of a backstory about about this one and um, I thought it would be interesting to go into it. So Chesh Nazanan or um, like a jinx, so when you like talk about casting a spell or an evil eye, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of that of one course, before. Of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's certainly yeah. my family we use that a lot growing up, but it's, it's used to mitigate saying it's it's used to mitigate uh, uh, bravado or saying something too good about you you're complimenting yourself or being yeah. uh, happy with you know it like so in my family it was used as a suppressive that that you could never say anything good like it was like oh what a beautiful meal <laughs> don't say that we had a nice meal you know it was <laughs> something bad is going to happen and so uh, yeah it's basically but I know in other cultures like the Italian cultures that the, the idea of the evil eye mm -hmm. exists it's so yeah. you're so um, and you're always worried that if you get a new car or you know you're in a great relationship that other people are going to chesh bezanan they're going to uh, right is that what you're where, where we're going with it's this Mona? absolutely uh -huh. yeah so I wanted to just sort of highlight how historically this evolved and um, yeah it's something that my family actually never did and um, never really spoke about so I'm, I'm, I'm learning as we go <laughs> um, so historically the evil eye appeared about 5,000 years ago and it was found in the Christian Muslim and Jewish cultures but it's also found in Buddhist and Hindu societies um, and it uh, is believed to be cast by a malevolent glare um, caused by misfortune and injury. So it's basically the same thing of what you were saying. Like if you say anything positive, you've got to sort of like protect it with this provision. Um, and so a lot of the historical cultures have a talisman or a jewelry that um, is created to protect us from uh, this evil eye. And right. I'm sure you've all seen it that the blue Turkish eye with the yes. um, different colored blue eyes. Yeah, so this is how this um, sort of evolved is we wanted to protect ourselves from this evil eye um, and we wanted to develop something that would protect us from it. So in the Turkish culture, they have the, the blue eye with the different colors. So the dark blue um, color is believed to uh, relate to good karma and energy and the sky blue is related to the symbolism of truth. So together, this combined color is believed to ward off curses. 
And um, in Arabic, um, they use the word nazar, which has the meaning of sight or surveillance. Um, so when you have a new baby or a business or a car um, and you want to wish them good luck, you, you give them this talisman. Wait, we say now that in, though, nazar, nazar. That, that's, nazar, uh, nazar, yeah. That comes so from Arabic? Origins. Yep. Oh. Yeah, mm. that's right. Um, so do you know what in, in Iranian culture we do to burn off these evil evil feelings and spirits? Have have you do you do es, this in your fan? household? Do you? Esfan? Yes, yeah. we burn esfan to ward off the evil eye. So um, these seeds are placed in a tin, um, and it's called wild rue seeds um, in English, and they are meant to ward off the evil eye. So I was just wondering, do any of your family members do this? Um, because yeah. my family actually never did. So <laughs> we, we, my, we we always do it. I even know the esfan esfan dune esfan sadusine harkas in reza dune mar cheshmo sadusine. Wow. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Go, Gian, you're teaching us that's something today. Wait, uh, Keon's, you, you, don't, you never heard of that? I didn't know the, so the I, whole you don't need. You don't need the voodoo like my family does. <laughs> no, my, <laughs> we did, <what> about that? <laughs> my mom does it every time she's here, almost oh. every day. And she doesn't do that. That's fan, that's fan. Well, she, she doesn't sing she, the song. She, she whispers it. I, uh, I've oh, never, right. It just sounds like some witchcraft. Like, <laughs> 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 it is pretty. I mean, this is the kind of thing we got to keep away from the white people. You know, they're, they're going to see us doing this and, you know, but. Uh, have you, did you guys do this, uh, Shia, in your family? Just as fan. As fan yes, 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 yes. Yes, yeah. yes, you do it, yeah. I have a question. What about salt water? So when, my, when I was little, my parents would lick their fingers and touch us and say namak, and I hated that. Growing up, I always hated it. So that apparently Stops the chesh yes. yeah. yeah. Do you know this, Mona? Yeah, so um, I read something about the chesh mm -hmm. um as well. Is, is that LinkedIn? They put I think so. Yeah. yeah, so they talk about the Cheshmishur, the sour well, which eye. is linked yeah. in with. And that's actually yeah. why in it's the like Greek culture, salty. when you're getting married, apparently people spit after the bride and groom walk, I guess, to, to make sure that... Isn't that awful? That, yeah, terrible. <laughs> Can you imagine, imagine being spat on? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a... It, you're right. These are all themed with the eye. Yes, that's so they're all linked in with the eye. And um, it's interesting because our family didn't have these traditions growing up, but um, we, we did talk about the Cheshma Roshan and the Cheshma Choshkel Mibina, but this Cheshma Nazanam, it was new to me. Um, and it's interesting that, Jion, um, this, this is something your family did quite yeah. um, regularly. Yeah, we're old school. We got all the superstitions. We're old all the, all the, school, yeah. man, very. Yeah. Actually, Cheshma Roshani, actually, Chesh, I mean, Cheshet Roshan, has also uh, another meaning which is a negative meaning for example you did something wrong mm -hmm. and then i would say to you hope oh. you did some you know the, the mm. connotation can be mis misunderstood what's the what's the uh translation that you're it's the exact same thing but the way you say it it's sarcastic can be sarcastically ah. said and oh. the connotation is that oh cheshmam oh you've done this great that's yeah. great like you made a mistake or you've done something awful yes all right. Oh, right, like in the context, depends on the context yeah. you use it. Reza, did you do, uh, did you have the Chesh Nazanam and, and the Espan and all that when you were going? Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, the, the Espan, the whole thing, that, even the song that you were singing, I remember my uh, grandmother <laughs> used to sing, but I, I never memorized it, that's I've, crazy. I, I gotta memorize. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I, I just say compliments to Reza so someone else will Chesh me him and bad things will happen. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to already. I'm on the right track. <laughs> I'm going to put my saliva on Reza so I can oh namak him. That's right. <laughs> namak, <laughs> namak all of us, please. Yes. Uh, Good one. Well, um, okay. So, Mona, you just discovered Chesh Zadan? Well, I knew about it. Like, I knew about the evil eye, but I never, like, I never really delved deep into the reasons why and the origins of it. And I, and the S-Fan, I've heard, like, everyone's like, you got to burn S-Fan, S-Fan. But because my family never did it, I really ne never paid attention to it. But I, I wonder if these traditions and cultures are, are really something that, you know, what do you feel about it? Is it something that, you know, the Iranian diaspora should continue? Is it something that, you know, is something, is it something that we do want to pass down to our well, next well, generation well, well one thing know? i would one thing i would say about this is <laughs> is that uh, what what i love about it is that 
again, this is part of the secret society stuff. Like this is the connective tissue stuff that most non-Iranians would not know what the hell we're talking about. I mean, we could say the evil eye, but they're certainly not going to know what Esfand is, right? So that no, that is okay. uh, that's the that's the secret code th- stuff that that is really, I believe, what uh, what ties us together much more than than um, politics or or you know even even ideas or ideologies this is this type of thing mm-hmm. that we've grown up with um whether it should continue i mean it's 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 kind of uh see i want to say it's nonsense but then uh, i'll invite the voodoo spirits against me so <laughs> yeah, i gotta yeah, be careful, be careful. <laughs> uh thank you mona we'll talk to you next thank week thank you take care bye that's mona kiani mona from melbourne find her page at englishy farsi on instagram Well, we mentioned earlier, uh, Keon, that we uh, got a bunch of letters and a bunch of comments uh, based on our special edition from last week. Yeah. Want to take it away? Yeah, of course. So last week on episode 74, we had a Rook special on the anniversary of the horrific downing of flight PS752, which of course killed 176 innocent souls. So as expected, people wrote into that episode on YouTube. We have Sepid Homa wrote, it's heart wrenching to listen to all these stories. Thanks for remembering. And then we have Iman Sadegzadeh wrote, We must never stop pushing for justice. And then Shahriar Gilan Dust wrote, Jian, thank you for remembering the subject. Thank you, Shahriar. And then we have Shad Miran wrote, Thanks, Rook Crew, for your work on this commemoration. Merci, thank you. And then moving on to Instagram, we have username Nassim Ab wrote, This is a shared pain for our nation. As the poet Shamlu says, those who passed this year were the most loving among the living. Mm. Beautiful. And then Pegita Mahmoudzadeh wrote, hoping for a resounding and powerful voice of justice. And then moving on to Facebook, we have Mujgan Bigdilo wrote, so much pain in their voices. It's devastating to lose loved ones in a terrorist attack. Hopefully they see justice very soon. Yes. Yeah. And then Rita Panna wrote, this devastating crime will forever stay in the minds of us Iranians. Thank you, Jian, for the interviews. Thank you, Rita. And then Michelle Mahdavi wrote, My husband's friend's cousin was on that plane. She was a young teenager. May she rest in peace. And then we have Nazila Rafizadeh wrote, I listened to the entire program with tears in my eyes. How can we ever forget and forgive? Mm. And then we have Ali Sharma wrote, Thank you, Jian John. Listening to this episode, I couldn't stop my tears. Like many, I feel frustrated by the lack of justice and accountability. I lost a very dear and sweet friend on that flight. Thanks again for all your efforts. Well, condolences to you, Ali. And then it feels wrong even just saying this, but uh, we have the letter of the week on YouTube goes to Afshin Ganbadi Siakali wrote... My deepest condolences to all the families of those who lost their dearest and loved ones on flight PS752. I just hope the truth comes out soon and those who committed this atrocity will be brought before an international court of law to stand in trial for their crimes. We won't ever forget, nor forgive. Thank you. Uh, That's Afshin Kambari Siakali. Thank you, Kian. Thanks for uh, doing that. And... um, Thank you to all of you who've written in about that episode and who've listened to that that episode and shared it. Um, and uh, it, it is appreciated that uh, you let us know your feelings. This is full time for Rook for today. For more about our show and for all of our episodes, rookmedia.com, where you can also go to our patrons page, rookmedia.com. Thank you to the amazing team who put this show together. That's the fabulous Keon, Groovy Shia, and Captain Reza. Producer Susan, Ponta the Artist, Thoughtful Nagin, Savvy Roham, Master Muhammad, and Aray Mertad. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe on any of our platforms, or all of them, if you've not done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Giangomeshi. 
And as ever, take care of yourselves, wherever you are in the world. Remember, Mizunbashi.